What are the mysterious phantasms of Major League Baseball? Do they challenge our conception of what is real and what is not real? A couple of years ago, I came across an article in the Washington Post about the phantoms of Major League Baseball. Intrigued, I dug into it a little and found a lot more, including an entry in 2040 Sports called The Amazing Phantasms of Major League Baseball. There's even a Wikipedia page. So what are these things? Eventually, I got in contact with the granddaughter of a famous sports writer who had attempted an audacious experiment to create his own phantasm. The results of his experiment are unsettling, but also exciting, because they prove the world just might be a little more magical than we think. Stay tuned. In the movie The Matrix, the hero is given a choice. Take the blue pill and remain within the comfortable reality you know, or choose the red pill and open yourself up to a very different, deeper reality. Today we'll explore a mystery from the sports world, which might force us to confront something similar. The possibility that the world is not what it seems. In May of 1918, Moonlight Proctor of the Boston Red Sox, just called up from the minors, was thrown into the game to pinch run for Babe Ruth. He stole a base and helped the Sox get the win. A promising start to a major league career, right? But Ruth, angry about being pulled out, stormed off before the final out and went on the mother of all drinking binges, which ended the next morning when citizens found him passed out on a park bench outside of Boston Water Hole. Hoping to soothe the Babe's hurt feelings, the Sox sent Proctor back down to the minors and he never saw the majors again, or so the story goes. Except there's no documentation showing Moonlight ever played in Boston or anywhere in the Red Sox system or for that matter in any major league organization. In fact, there's almost no evidence he existed at all except for one very strange meeting in a Pennsylvania diner in 1934. This is a story that challenges our comfortable notion of what is real and what is imaginary. A story that explores the creative power of collective mind. A story of the mysterious phantasms of Major League Baseball. By the 1920s, Ruth had been traded to the Yankees and rechristened the Sultan of Swat, the Colossus of Crash, the Great Bambino. This was a time when sports writers such as Grantland Rice, Red Cannon, and Damon Runyon turned great athletes into legends and legends into myths. Said Rice, when a sports writer stops making heroes out of athletes, it's time to get out of the business. So these scribes who couldn't get enough Bambino stories went digging for everything about, about him they could find. Especially prized were tales from the early days, back when he was still in Boston. For example, there's the legend of the grand piano sunk at the bottom of a lake in Sudbury, Massachusetts. When the Bay played for the Sox, he and his wife bought a small house by the lake in that rural town. In the winter off season, they loved to entertain local youth who would crowd into the cottage where Helen entertained them on the piano while her husband clowned around. One time, the place became too crowded, so they pushed the piano down a hill onto the ice-covered pond where she could keep playing. It worked out great, except when the day was done, the piano wouldn't budge. So they left it there until the spring when the ice thawed and it sank to the bottom where it still supposedly sits today. Well, somewhere, perhaps in a smoky speakeasy, or in a cigar-filled locker room, the name Moonlight Proctor first escaped someone's lips. The press lapped it up, and the anecdotes about Moonlight started coming day after day. It was said that he had worked in the coal mines of West Virginia before running away at 16 to chase his baseball dreams. He'd supposedly developed a keen eyesight by practicing at night under a full moon to avoid the notice of a disapproving father. According to lore, the glare of the sun gave him fits, but inserted him into the game on a stormy day or in the twilight hours of an extra inning affair, and his combination of unique vision and speed gave him a crucial edge. After toiling away in various minor league towns for a dozen years, he finally got a shot with Boston that May. However, the only evidence anyone ever found of Moonlight was a scribbled name on a Red Sox lineup card, which could have been just about anyone. No contract, no record in the minors. But that didn't slow the press. The legend of Moonlight Proctor waxed and waned throughout the 20s as baseball's popularity soared and the sport became known as the national pastime. Rumor was he still labored away in obscure towns in the minors, and every now and then a young player made it to the bigs with tales of having played with Moonlight Proctor somewhere along the way. Well, 
in the 1920s, baseball became a huge part of the national consciousness. Radio and newspapers for the first time connected the whole country. And popular culture began to form among the masses. You know, and a story that was picked up on the wire would reach everywhere within days. By the 1930s, the Great Depression had washed away the roar of the 20s, and national attention fell on the struggle to survive. Professional baseball no longer did so well at the gate, but in some ways, the game had borrowed deeper into the public's imagination. It reminded people of better times. In 1934, Red Cannon, a sports writer for the Daily Post, published a story on Moonlight, and it got picked up and reprinted around the country. Some days later, a shocking telegram arrived at Red's desk. The message invited him to meet, in a diner outside Pittsburgh, none other than the man himself, Moonlight Proctor. The story of Red Cannon traveling to meet Moonlight was recently told to me by his granddaughter, Nikki. Grandpa debated whether to even go to Pittsburgh, but no further way of contacting Moonlight had been left, so it was either make the nine hour train ride or do the sensible thing and drop the matter altogether. But over the years, Moonlight had become somewhat of an obsession with him. So he found himself packing up enough cigars and whiskey for a day's journey. After the long trade ride, Red reached a diner, nestled beneath an old factory in Pittsburgh and found a spent figure with broad shoulders and a furrowed face hunched over black cock. Moonlight didn't so much look defeated, which many men did in those days, as lost, like a man who found himself in a time and place he didn't belong. Strangely, he didn't actually remember much about his upbringing. In fact, he couldn't even quite remember just where in West Virginia he came from. The only details from his life before that day in Boston were things that could have been plucked from newspaper stories that were printed many years later. His recollections added nothing new to what was known about him. It was only when talking about the later years, as the decade of the 20s progressed, that his memories became more detailed, more solid. And it was in discussing these things that his mind seemed most at ease, his eyes brightening, the cracks around them loosening. The big league dream apparently didn't die easy for Moonlight. He picked up all kinds of side jobs while continuing to play ball. At some point, he also picked up a wife who traveled around with him. They tried repeatedly to have a child but could not, and she died tragically when a truck they were hitching in flipped over. Moonlight later married again, after he had finally given up on making it to the majors. But it was much the same story. Failed attempts at having children, followed by a tragic death on the highway, this time involving an icy road and a ditch. Now, I know what you're thinking, and certainly the thought had entered Red's mind, too, that some desperate and lonely minor league ball player had simply adopted Moonlight's persona from the newspapers. But Red had grown up in New York City, and if someone was bullshitting him, he'd probably know it. He sensed no lying in the man, and the man didn't want anything from Red other than more information on his own distant past, which had become hazy and dreamlike to him. Red felt sure that either the man truly believed he was Moonlight Proctor, or he was, in fact, Moonlight Proctor, the mythical ball player who had pinch run for Babe all those years ago. Something about the whole experience haunted Red forever after, and perhaps now it haunts us. This is from his notes. I went looking to fill in the blanks about Moonlight's life, but I sensed he was seeking the same from me. He didn't quite come out and say it, and perhaps didn't even consciously think it, but he seemed to be digging for details about himself, especially his past before that fateful day with the Red Sox, but really anything about his past, about who he was. According to Nikki, the whole uncanny experience deeply unsettled her grandfather. The sadness of it, yes, but more than that, Something didn't add up, and it shook Red's very belief system about the world. The line between what was real and what was not real began to seem unreliable, and things would only get stranger. As the Depression dragged on, Americans looked to baseball as a kind of road home to a place that no longer existed, if it ever even had, but which still remained somehow fresh in the mind. Other mythical players were discovered, such as Chop Clements, who had one special skill, hitting a Baltimore chop to advance the runners or Chicky Fowler, who made only one pitch for the Cubs and ended up perfect, or Patsy Connor, whose custom-made bat was so heavy the ball boys couldn't lift it. 
Evidence of these players in the record books was murky at best, and yet teammates could remember them clearly. The world went to war in the 1940s, and by the 50s, Red had become a legendary sports writer, syndicated around the country. And as tends to happen when one gets older, he began to wonder what might come next, if indeed there is a next. Always, his mind went back to Moonlight Proctor. Knowing he might only have so many columns left in him, he decided to attempt an experiment so crazy he couldn't tell anyone about it for fear of being committed. And thus was born Grover Finch. Grover Finch was Grandpa's Frankenstein monster, only instead of working in a medieval castle with a corpse and bolts of lightning, he had a typewriter at a desk on the smoky ninth floor of the post. According to the story, Red carefully crafted in 1941, the recently called up Finch was brought into a major league game for the first time in the bottom of the fourth. His team, the Philadelphia Athletics, trailed by two, runners on second and third. It was a dreamy August afternoon, though dark clouds were rolling on in on the horizon. With one out, the Yankees were expected to walk the batter to set up the double play. Connie Mack, the legendary manager of the A's, instructed Finch to look like he meant business, but to not swing. The objective was to just try and draw the walk. Mack made it very clear under no circumstances should Finch swing at a pitch. If he struck out, Chapman was on deck anyway, and he'd been on fire hitting 340 at that point. Finch, according to Red's fiction, and remember this is fiction, had slaved away in the minors for so long that the other farm leaguers called him Pops, and many of them took advantage of his sage advice. And one thing Finch had always told younger players was this, when you get your shot, you better take it. There might not be a second chance. Grover Finch dragged himself to the plate with the bat on his neck crossed under both arms like a crucifix. A world away, the Germans drove towards Moscow and Japanese torpedo bombers secretly practiced attacking ships in the harbor. He told himself a walk would be great, would help the team, but striking out without taking a single swing? He was a team player. Four was nothing if not a power hitter. It would ruin him, but this was his shot. And Coach Mack, now in his late 70s, seemed a little confused. How do you not take what might be your only shot in life? My grandfather not only put pieces of himself in that character, he put in stuff that resonates with all of us. Chance. Well, as you can guess, Red's story went on to describe how Finch did indeed take his shot, launching the home run that would make him briefly a hero, only to have the rug pulled out from under him by a vindictive manager who sent him back to the miners for ignoring instructions. Red added the clever detail that the game was called shortly later on on account of rain, and so official scoring was thus wiped from the books, along with any statistical evidence of Grover Finch. Red followed up this story with a few others, adding more details, and for a brief time, it sparked a cottage industry of related accounts of Grover Finch. Many players suddenly recalled encountering the man Red had invented, and several even described being present for his faithful home run that day against the Yankees. Red never let a single soul in on his experiment until many years later when he confided in his granddaughter, Nikki, who he had developed a close relationship with. When asked why he had created Finch, Red merely shrugged thoughtfully. It was almost like confessing a sin he wanted to get off his chest. But Red's experiment might perhaps have been more grounded in science than most of us dare. Wolfgang Pauli, one of the pioneers of quantum physics and a Nobel Prize winner, worked closely with Carl Jung to develop a radical theory of reality. Pauli drew from experiments on quantum physics, while Jung had spent a lifetime probing the mind. They theorized that underlying the physical world and the world of the mind is a more fundamental reality that connects them both. And here's where it gets interesting. Aspects of this underlying reality can emerge both as a psychological phenomena or as something physical and tangible. For example, flying saucers might be both real in the sense that they can be picked up on a radar or imaginary in the sense that they're a product of our collective After Red published his articles on Grover Finch, the 1950s stretched into the 60s with the Bay of Pigs, Lee Harvey in Vietnam. The weary country seemed to crawl into the 70s like a washed up sailor on the shore. A lifetime of whiskey and cigars had hollowed Red out. But his columns went on, 
his work seeming to inflate him with purpose, and those that loved him could almost convince themselves that he was somehow impervious to damage. However, once retirement came, he shriveled rapidly, and by the time Ronald Reagan was sworn in, he was bedridden, which was where a surprise visitor found him, Grover Finch. I came home one day to find a stranger sitting at his bedside, someone claiming to be Grover Finch. I assumed, of course, it was someone playing a joke, but I allowed it to proceed because Grandpa was more alive than he'd been in years, even sitting up to light a cigar that Grover had offered him. So what's the harm in it, right? What struck Nikki, however, was the way the man claiming to be Finch seemed more concerned with probing Red for details about his own distant past, exactly the same as according to Red's old notes Moonlight had once done in a diner in Pittsburgh. The two of them traded details about Finch's life. The former ball player could easily recall events from after that fateful day he smacked a home run in Philly. He explained how he'd landed at Omaha Beach, then returned to the minor league circuit after the war. Red, for his part, told him how Finch's family had labored in the paper mills of Maine and how his mother's voice could travel for miles to call him home to dinner. Finch seemed pleased at hearing these things, and he explained that on the whole he'd not had a bad life, far as he could recall anyway, but it had been a lonely one. Like Moonlight, he lamented never having children. When the nurse announced it was time to shut things down for the night, Finch nodded, said goodbye. A hard life had left his face almost as old as grandpa's, but his legs still moved with the grace of an athlete. And when he reached the door, he turned back. He seemed grateful for all the answers my grandfather had given him, but still a little sad, like it would never be enough. I'll never forget his words. I've traveled all my days up and down this country, he said. And here and there, Every once in a while, I've bumped into someone just like me. I thought you'd want to know, Mr. Cannon. There are others. That encounter with Grover Finch at her grandfather's bedside haunts Nikki to this day, just as Red's meeting with Moonlight in a Pittsburgh diner all those years ago haunted him. And it leads us to ponder, what exactly are the phantasms of baseball? And are there any still out there trying to get to the bigs? trying to get on with life, searching for answers about their past.